Welcome to Beyond Bite Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond Bite Wings. In today's episode, we will be giving our listeners updates on various matters. And within the studio, we have Robert. Good afternoon. And myself, Ash. How are we doing today? We're doing well. Same here. I'm it's doing a good well day, too. Except it's too darn hot outside. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> we are recording here in Texas and recently it's been nothing but triple digits. Yes. And it's not even July yet. It is crazy, but I'm glad that our studio has air conditioning. (laughs) Otherwise I wouldn't know (laughs) how I would be doing. (laughs) So what would be the first update that you think we should give to our listeners? Gosh, I don't know where to start. There's what? Six things on our list. Let's start with the idle funds. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Okay. So idle now for our listeners that may not remember what it was when the COVID happened, one of the relief options that were available, made available to employers, including dentists, was applying for a specific loan called EIDL. And which, that's, that's E-I-D-L. Correct. And in fact, the L stands for loan. So I feel like saying EIDL loan, there's, there's a bit of read that. <laughs> the, the D does not stand for dental. No, it does not. <laughs> <laughs> it does not. So if I recall correctly, I think it stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And there have been numerous changes throughout since when it was first offered. Basically, I think the attractive thing about that loan at that time was the very reasonable interest rate on a 30-year term lent loan. Well, you know, at the time that they were offered, it wasn't that attractive. It was competitive. Right. It was three and three quarter percent. Mm -hmm. The attractive thing was that it was fixed for 30 years. Right. And I know that's a long time and a lot of people are saying, why would I want a 30-year loan? Well, you can pay it off anytime you want to, but it gave you money to be able to continue to pay your employees and to run your business during the pandemic. And initially there was, well, there was a a period where you could apply for a grant. And I think the government sort of fumbled around with those a lot. Everybody was sort of more or less promised $10,000 and and most people that I know didn't get that. They Some people ended up getting $1,000 per employee to a maximum of $10,000, but I think most of our clients didn't even get that. But then later on, the SBA sort of got their act together and started sending out $150,000 to most people that had, had applied for the idle loan. And then subsequently they came back and and I think they maybe had another name for the program. What a, a, a I can't remember what it was called. But they added more funds to it. I they think. added more funds to it, and they they told some people oh, the targeted idle loan. That's what it was called. Right. And they told people that if you had previously applied for an idle loan, you could increase the amount of your balance from the hundred fifty thousand to as much as five hundred thousand, and it was still fixed at three and three quarter percent which at the time was still a very competitive rate, a little more so because rates were starting to creep up. And now here we are in 2022 and three and three quarters looks pretty darn good. I agree. (laughs) I would have to agree. And it's going to be better by the end of the year. By the end of the year, the prime rate is going to be probably a percent and a half higher than that. It's probably going to be five and a quarter. And here we are today with the idle loans fixed still at three and three quarter percent. And they've, they've sort of loosened the purse strings on the accepted uses of those funds. So you have more flexibility with the way you can use those funds. The problem is now the program's depleted. The money's gone. I believe that ended at the end of April. So that's the update really is that that program is over at this point. But the payments haven't started yet unless you've been making them voluntarily. Because initially the payments on the auto loans were deferred for 12 months. And then before the 
expiration of that 12 months, they came back and extended it an additional 12 months. And before that expired, they extended it for an additional six months. <clears throat> now, I've had a couple of clients that have come back to me and, and, and ask me, because of the PPP loans and because of the current administration's attitude towards student loan debt, do I think that the government might waive the repayment of the auto loans? And I haven't seen or heard of that anywhere, but I don't know that I would be totally surprised if that happened. So my advice is if you haven't started making the payments on your idle loan yet, and it's not due yet, I think most of the payments start in maybe November of this year, mm -hmm. pay as little as possible for a few months and let's see what the government does. They may actually forgive a portion of that debt. Now, I don't know that there's any other professional out there that may say that, and maybe that's going out on a limb. That's just my personal opinion. It's not based on something that I've read or, or heard. It's just something that I've kind of reading between the lines. So we'll see if that happens. Worst case scenario, it doesn't happen. And you have to make the payments for some period of time. If you sell your practice, you're going to have to pay that off. It's just like any other debt. It would be due on sale. But otherwise, you know, if, if you're a young person just starting out, I mean, you can make payments on that loan for what is it, 27 and a half years. And then there'll be a small balloon payment at the end to make up for the two and a half years of deferral on the front end. Mm, I see. Now, great information. But the whole time, it's going to be three and three quarter percent, that which is, is looking better and better and better. Every day, I completely agree. It's actually a shame that they ran out of funds. But, you know, aside from the idle funds, that are no longer available. There was this other COVID relief option available specifically to medical providers that included dentists. It was the provider relief funds, right, offered by HHS, which is the Health and Human Services Department. Right. The amount was different. It wasn't like the idle where they could get a fixed flat amount of 150000 per entity. It really depended on numerous factors. Now, one thing you guys, especially the ones that have applied for this, may be aware of, which is though the funds that you received could only be spent on certain types of things. In other words, allowable expenses. And when you signed the dotted line, you also agreed that you would be utilizing all those funds by a set given time. Otherwise, whatever remains needs to be paid back to them. The update that I have for you guys, especially around this time of the year, is that for the people that received these PRF or provider relief funds between January 1st of 2021 till June 30th of 2021, you should have already spent all of those funds by June 30th of 2022. If there's still some remainder portion of it that hasn't been spent, it needs to be returned back to HHS. Now, when is the deadline for that? filing of that report. For that, you still have some time. That you don't have to do till September 30th. Now that's the given deadline, but we know from previous years that it also has a lot to do with the portal being open, open and when it's available. That depends on them. I don't believe that's open yet. I was just going to ask, is the portal even open yet? Not to my knowledge, not as of today as we're recording. Now, the good news is for our clients, for clients of Edwards & Associates, we're very active on our blog. As soon as that portal's open, we are going to post something there to alert all our clients. If you guys are working with other advisors that are helping you keep track of this, just ask them when this portal will be open or available to you guys for the reporting. So that's what I had on the HHS. Good information. Very good information. People need to know that. They need to know what that deadline is. So September 30th for the reporting, if you receive funds between January 1st and June 30th of 2021. Correct. So the next question would be, what's the deadline if they receive funds after June 30th before December 31st? Is that going to be the end of this year? So the good news is you don't have to worry about that till March 31st of 2023. Okay, great. And I believe you have to utilize those funds by the end of this year. Okay. So you have to make sure that you utilize all of those funds by the end of this year. And the reporting doesn't need to take place till the end of first quarter of 2023. So basically the deadline for using the funds precedes the deadline for filing the report by 90 days. Roughly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. 
Now, moving on to some other things. These are specifically, these were topics that you specifically wanted to talk about, Robert. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think you mentioned something about NPI. Yeah, I had a couple of instances the last few days where I just wanted to throw in a, a few comments about the NPI numbers. Everybody, every dentist out there knows what an NPI number is, but I'm not sure every dentist out there knows that there's two different types of NPI numbers. There's a type one and a type two. Type one NPI number is sort of like your social security number. You get one attached to you when you graduate from dental school and become licensed, and you have that your whole life until you cease practicing and, and, and forfeit your license when you're you know, financially independent and later on in life. But there's a type two number. And the type two NPI number would be for the entity through which you're practicing. So why do you need both? Well, you, if you're never going to hire an associate and you're going to be the only person in that entity in your dental practice that's the producer, you never need a type two NPI number. But if you're ever going to sell your practice, or if you're ever going to have an associate come and work in your practice, or even if you're going to have a specialist come into your practice and provide services to your patients, you need a type 2 NPI number so you can file claims under the practice NPI number. Yes, the provider will still have to provide his NPI number in the, I believe it's the bottom left corner of the form, the claim form. But then the practice NPI number goes in the bottom right corner. And so the money still comes to the practice that way. And at the end of the year, you get your 1099 from the insurance companies, and that would go to the practice, not the provider. So I recommend to save time and, and stress later on that you get a, a type 2 NPI number sometime during your career before you're going to really need it. Case in point, I have a transition that's ongoing right now, and we're scrambling to get a type 2 NPI number to allow the purchaser to be able to file claims in the practice. So if we had done that, or if the client had done that years ago, then we wouldn't be scrambling now at closing trying to get it done. Makes sense. So yeah. it just saves some stress, and, and you're going to need it eventually anyway. If you grow to any size at all, you're going to need an associate at some point, or you'll have specialists coming in to provide services to your patients. So you should get that type 2 NPI number, and it's not difficult to get. There's a website. I don't have that information here handy, but there's a website. You can go and, and get that, and it can be issued in as little as 10 days. I think even their website says it's it's commonly not 10 days. That's sort of the maximum. They say they can beat that by a few days. I see. Yeah. I mean, I would think by default they should apply for both, just to be safe. Well, that's my thought, but you, as long as you have an incorporated entity, yes. If you're a sole proprietor, you cannot get a type two. As long as you're an incorporated entity, whether it's a partnership or whether it's a S corp or a regular C corp, C, all those, yes, you can get a type two number. In, a, in other words, if your business has its own tax ID number. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, good information on that and great tip, honestly. What was the other thing that you wanted to talk about regarding retirement? Regarding retirement, there's just, as far as this episode is called updates, and there are some proposed updates to retirement plans coming down the pike. And, and the big one that really I'm excited about as a financial planner is that there is a proposal before Congress at this point to extend the date by which you have to start taking required minimum distributions. Now, they just did this a couple of years ago. It used to always be the year in which you turned 70 and a half, and six months later, you had to start taking required minimum distributions. Okay, they just changed that from 70 and a half to 72 during the pandemic. Now they're proposing changing that to age 75. Now, why does that matter? Because everybody's sitting out there thinking, well, I'm not going to be working when I'm 75. I'm going to take my money before that. Well, you know, if you don't have to, you can leave your money in your retirement account, let it continue to grow on a tax-deferred basis until you have to start taking the required minimum distributions, and they're going to delay that to age 75. So that allows you three more years of tax-free growth in your retirement funds. Right, which makes sense because the less money you're pulling out, the more money you have on compounded Compounding, growth. Compounding, that's correct. Absolutely. So that's just a little tidbit. We'll keep you updated on that. We should know by the end of August whether that's going to be passed by Congress or not. All right. Great. Thank you, Robert. 
Now, let's talk about some of the warnings that we have to give to our listeners. Warning, warning. <laughs> Specifically this month, we have been getting an insane amount of questions from our clients regarding some of the emails that they've been receiving. Now, in the past, I mean, we all know what spam is. You know, we've all received spam emails, but recently they've started receiving a lot of spam emails that are aligning with some of the articles that are being posted on the forums that they're, you know, members of. And that's when they question, oh, is this even a spam? Maybe this is something I need to look into. Well, and I'm not sure. I, I agree with that question. I'm not sure they're really qualify as spam because they're directed specifically for to, to dentists. Right. But we sort of refer to them as spam because they're from questionable organizations. And I say that because this has to do, by the way, with the R&D credit several months ago and more recently with the ERC credit. A lot of the companies are soliciting dentists, telling them that they qualify for the ERC credit, and they don't even have the information with which to make that decision. We've had clients that, that sent them their 941s, that's their payroll tax report, and that's certainly not enough information for anybody to determine whether you're eligible for the ERC credit or not. But from that information, these supposed tax credit companies are telling the clients that they're, they're eligible for up to $36,000 per employee. And that's just not true. Just be careful. And a lot of clients that I've talked to don't remember that we actually have already filed ERC claims for them in 2021, and they've already received the money. But there's no way some of these firms are going to know that. So if they take your information and you hire them and they file another ERC claim for refund, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going to get the money or not, but you're probably going to get a letter from the IRS or some other governmental agency questioning why you're trying to, to double dip. So just be careful. Oh, absolutely. I think if you get one of those emails and you think about acting on it, call your CPA first and see if they've already done this for you. One of the tactics that some of these firms is using is telling them that their CPA doesn't even know about this credit. Well, there might be some that don't know about the credit, but you probably shouldn't be using them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Just to put it bluntly. So do a little investigative work on your own to determine whether this is something that would really apply to you or not. I mean, we've done an analysis on, I think, what every one of our clients. All of our clients. And we've that. filed claims for most of them, and we're filing additional claims for some of them for future years. But the credit is, is really determined. And, it, and if you go to the IRS website and look at the frequently asked questions, it's going to tell you how you qualify for the credit. But some of these firms are, 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 I wouldn't say they're totally ignoring that information, but I think they are, because they're telling you that even if you weren't shut down, you still might qualify for the credit. Now, it is true. There are various avenues of figuring out how they may qualify, because I know that they've made some changes in some subsequent rules where they said, oh, now the startup entities may qualify for the ERC credit. But even so, I feel like I, I have to completely agree with you, Robert, that a lot of these tax credit specialty companies, what they're doing is I feel like they're being selective with the qualifications and not accounting for all the rules that you need to look at before making that determination. And I think I should also mention that these companies are charging a percentage of what credit you will be receiving. So it is in their best interest to make sure that that amount is as high as possible. So, and, and, and you, you, want, you want to know something else that's funny, Robert. They're apparently making clients sign agreements that where they're taking a, away liability for anything that may have been filed incorrectly. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're not taking liability themselves. They're, no, they're you're, not. You're, right. you're, you're waiving the ability to challenge them or to sue them if, if you get in trouble. And that's a warning sign right there. Right, right. So, right. so I guess the bottom line is, you know, I know when most people sign these lengthy agreements, they don't read them, but please either read it or send it to somebody else that's knowledgeable. I mean, an attorney or some other advisor, have them read it, you know, and make sure that it's in your best interest to sign it. Yeah. In fact, I would say because it is a tax credit, your first go-to should be your CPA. Yes. Right. Now, whether that person is knowledgeable or not, I would say that's a great starting point. Yeah. 
I and, agree. And, you know, while you were talking about these tax credits, I think there was another one that you mentioned, the R&D one, the research and development credit. Yeah, that one was, that one's not so recent, but we went through the same sort of round of, of, of these tax credit firms contacting people about the R&D credit, maybe last year or maybe six months ago. Same thing. You know, I think they, they convinced a lot of people that they were due to, for this huge credit. And subsequent to that, the IRS has come out and said, I don't know that they have specifically said that dentists don't qualify for it, but I've seen a lot of literature that indicates that it would be difficult to qualify for the R&D credit as a, as a dentist. Now, dental labs, yes, they qualify. So it, it just depends on the individual facts and circumstances. Don't just think that since you're a dentist, you're going to qualify because somebody told you you did. Because this goes back to a term that Donald Trump created, and that is fake news. And God bless him, but that's, <laughs> that's a term that's in our lexicon every day now is fake news. And a lot of this information is not accurate. Right, right, right. So definitely, definitely, whenever you get these emails, even if you feel like you may qualify, definitely do your due diligence work, contact all the people that are knowledgeable in these topics, and then get informed before you take matters into your own hands. Yeah, it's just a warning, like we said, warning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then finally, the other one that I have here, and I'm bringing this, I don't know how prevalent these emails are, but I've had two clients one for sure who already acted upon after receiving one of these emails, which is this. There are companies out there that are sending out to PLC owners or LLC owners saying that, oh, it's time for you to file for your franchise tax return, especially for the clients that are here in Texas or their PLCs are based out of Texas. And what they're thinking is that, oh, this is not something my CPA is responsible for. So they're taking matters into their own hands and they're going ahead and filing for it themselves. Now, it is possible that your CPA may not be responsible for it, but... But I think it's unlikely because if a CPA prepares your corporate return or the corporate the, the return for your entity, whether it's an LLC, a PLLC, a, a PC, a PA, whatever it is, they're probably going to have already prepared your Texas state franchise tax return. Correct. So definitely check with them first before you file it. In this case, it wasn't really a big deal just because his annual revenues was below a certain threshold. But did he have to pay him a fee? He didn't have to. Good. Oh, you're talking about the company? Yeah. That I'm not sure of. Okay. Because a lot of these companies will charge you a fee up front, and then you find out, well, wait a minute, I've already filed the return, mm -hmm. and then you're just not going to get the money back. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, a, you know, it's a small fee, but it's still unnecessary. Absolutely. I agree. And that actually brings me to another thing. We actually don't have it here on the list, but homestead exemptions. Yeah, same thing. I've seen clients solicited to file to, to hire a company to file your homestead exemption, and they charge you $25. I actually had an employee that sent them $25 before she told me what it was for, and I said, you did what? <laughs> I mean, this is something you can do on your own. Pick up the phone. These days, I guess you can go online and fill out the form free, and you get a homestead exemption for your property taxes on your house, depending on the county you live in or this, yeah, depending on the county you live in, it will determine the amount of the exemption. It's anywhere from 15,000 to, I don't know, maybe 25 or 30,000 of exemption on the value of your house from property taxes. So again, it's not a tremendous amount of money. It could be, you know, $500. Mm -hmm. So it's still worth doing. Absolutely. But don't pay someone $25 to do it for you. You can do it yourself. And it doesn't take probably, I mean, honestly, I don't think it took me a minute to fill out the form. No, I'm completely with you on that. And I think the only thing to consider is the age, too, because I believe they have two kinds of exemption that you can qualify for, one above 65. And well, then... actually, there's more than two kinds of exemptions. I think there's one for veterans. There, ah, there's right, one right. for disabilities. There's one for over age 65. I yes. see, I see, I see. Yeah. But definitely not too complicated to hire someone to do this. No. I mean, there, there are boxes. Actually, when you get your property tax assessment on the back of that form, there are the boxes you can check for exemptions. And if you don't already have the exemptions, it should show on the front of the form if you already have the exemptions. If you don't, then you check the box on the back, you return it. And then so next year, then you'll have the exemptions going forward. Great tip. Great tip. All right, so that takes care of the warnings. 
And honestly, I believe we've covered everything here that I have on the list. So that was a great episode, Robert. Thank you so much for all your advice and tips. Thank you for hosting. Oh, absolutely. Now, for our listeners that have questions, feel free to reach us at info at eandassociates.com. And that's and spelled out, A-N-D. We look forward to hearing from you guys. Have Thank you. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to Beyond Bite Wings on your favorite podcast platform. For more info, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at eandassociates.com.